Yes, this year and regionals when it comes here. Uh, hopefully soon before the ban list changes because I don't know what's gonna get hit, what's not. And I like this ban list. I really like this list, and you know it, it feels good to me. I like this list. You know, no rulers. It'll make me feel happy. I just I just don't want my traps and stuff getting hit or like anything on the extra deck getting hit. So I just like uh I don't know. I don't know right now. I just don't want them like changing anything, but. Uh, Let's get on to this deck list. So, Three Mock and Fortress, standard staple. Now, everyone always overlooks really just how broken Mock and Fortress actually is. We have so many ways to summon it. You can discard itself and another machine type monster, and then summon itself back from the graveyard after you've discarded it for its summon. That's not well, a lot of people don't seem to get that fact that you can discard him to summon himself. So it's it's quite a uh, an interesting fact there about the uh, fortress. Also, he's a twenty five hundred, so he matches the uh, attack stats of Stardust. Uh, once to disturb a battle, pop a card on the field. Really good. And when he's targeted by a monster's effect you can look at your opponent's hand and discard a card from their hand. So if your opponent targets Fortress, well, you're going to start getting hand advantage and you're just going to start taking control of the game because, well, you just discarded one of their cards that may potentially help them later on down the road. And, and you look at your opponent's hand, too, before you discard. So you can see their hand, and if you know what deck they're playing, you can get rid of those problem cards that your opponent has in hand that they just do not need to lose because if they do, they're going to probably fall out in the game and lose the game. So like you're playing against Fire Fist, they end up targeting your Fortress. Well, you're going to be able to look in their hand, ditch out those tankies or those Wolf Barks before they get a chance to use them. Because you want to eliminate as much of their presence as possible. And you really want to start by getting rid of those problematic cards like such as Imbugents, you know, if they somehow target your fortress, which I doubt it, because they don't have, they don't use monsters that, well, they don't use monsters that target it, but like, if they did, you know, you could look in their hand, discard those Yamatos, discard those Cranes, get them to the graveyard, where they can't really be used anymore, where they're dead. You want to be able to get as much advantage as possible. So last night, I was in a duel against Fire Fist. Guy goes bear. He's his bear. Targets and pops Fortress. Well, guess what? Fortress, let I me mean, look at his hand. He had two cards in hand. One was a Tensu. The other was Wolf Bark. There was no way I was letting him have that Wolf Bark. I was like, you know, Wolf Bark getting to the grave right now. He was like, fuck. He lost the game because of that. Dark Worlds don't let, well, don't choose their Dark World monsters with Fortress. Their effects will go off. And both of them, too, because it was by your card effect. So, Dark World is a little bit of a bad matchup with Fortress, but yeah, just Fortress is so good, gets you so much advantage, and it just can keep coming back. That's the one thing I love about Fortress. Uh, gear Frame. A lot of people underlook Gear Frame and just look past it because of the fact that he's a level 4 18 beater. Now, we all know that when it's summoned, you can add a Machina monster from your deck to your hand, so that's your for well, that just adds your Fortress. Now, one of the things that's often overlooked is that Gear Frame is a Union monster. And Union monsters equip themselves to other monsters. Gear Frame equips itself to machine type monsters. Because it equips itself, it's treated as a spell card, so it could be MST'd. But when the equipped monster would be destroyed, you destroy the Gear Frame instead. 
So, you know, if you summon Gear Frame, and you have that Fortress to your hand, and you go for a first turn Fortress play and get Fortress on the field, make sure to equip it with Gear Frame. Because, you know, your opponent's going to want to either Dark Hole to get over it, or Torrential, or something on, with their monster on the field. Like, just waste the monster of theirs to get rid of your Fortress. You equip Gear Frame, that's not going to be so easy. Plus, then they have to get over it. It's a 2500 attack point monster, so they can't quite do that. Now, in gadgets, a lot of people like to play two. I like playing three of each of the gadgets, green, red, and yellow. Why? I like having monsters in hand. If I need to, I will just set it and pass or normal summon it and try to bait out my opponent into the one trap I have set face down while I have my other stuff in hand. It's all about baiting them out, getting them to waste their resources, and being able to explode in on them when, you, when necessary. Because this deck is a very strong controlling deck without being a control based deck. You just have to know how to, I mean you just have to know how to use your cards and when to use them. Now, the thing is, not a lot of decks have beaten my Machina Gadgets when I play them. Not to sound like I'm bragging, but if you know how to play, your opponent can't beat you. You just have to play it very slowly, very surely, and know how to conquer your opponent. And in a competitive environment, you want to be able to have as much hand control as possible and as much game presence as possible. That's honestly why I run three of each of the gadgets, because I can keep getting those surges off and keep getting the hand presence, and just keep getting that speed off, just keep getting those plays off. I'm sure there's probably something else I could run instead that would make the deck like that much better, but in my opinion, I don't think I need to take out a set of the gadgets, because I want to be able to have those gadgets to keep searching and keep bringing back my fortress, or to keep summoning my fortresses when I want to explode. And this deck does that just perfectly. Now, I used to hate this card, Tin Goldfish. I used to hate it. And believe it or not, it was one of the cards that I hated the most. Because I didn't find a practical use for it. I didn't think like this card was useful. I mean, everyone was using it in gadgets. And everyone was doing well with it. I didn't like it. At first, I didn't like it. I liked a slower-paced control build of gadgets. And then... I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to try to goldfish in the deck, and I'm going to take it to locals. I came first place three consecutive times at my locals, all because of Tin Goldfish. It allows you just to capitalize on your opponent and get a significant advantage over them. Because if you draw your first turn of the game, like you, like you play the rock paper, like you play rock paper scissors, you go first. You summon Tin Goldfish and summon a gadget. You right there have control. Because then you're going to get your search off your gadgets, and then you can overlay for Gear Gig and X, search out that another, t well, search out another tin goldfish, and just capitalize your hand like that, like that. Because you can just now suddenly start making Xs every turn, and your opponent's not going to be able to counter that. They're not going to be able to get over that. So, tin goldfish really does amazing things for you, and it allows you just to set up your plays quickly and fast, and get into fast, strong monsters. Your opponent just is not going to be able to get over in a turn or two, and it's going to take them a while to get over them. You can go for targets like 101, Black Sheep Corn, whatever you need, when you need it. That's why Tin Goldfish in this deck is so good. Plus, it's a water monster. So if you're playing against Burmales, and you want to be able to get, you know, get into Abyss Dweller, feel free. Go for Abyss Dweller first turn and walk out their graveyards. Lock them out. Because then, with how much back row you'll be having with the Abyss Dweller, there's no way that the Mermel player is going to beat you. Because they rely on their marksmen and their infantry effects in the graveyard to get over your back row. Well, if they don't have the ability to use those effects, they can't pop your back row. They go in, they lose the game. Because they have to go in and attack you to try to win. If they can't get your back row fast enough with their marksmen, they're not going to do shit to you, and they're going to lose the game solely just because of that. Plus, when you use Tin Goldfish as a material for Abyss Dweller, 
it's a 2200. It's a 2200 and it's very strong. Then you use it for 101. 101 becomes a 26. And that's really hard to get over. Even a Mermails. <clears throat> sure, they have Abyss lead, but that's only 2700. Plus, you have Dimensional Prisons, you have your stuff to get over it. <coughs> that, and if they do ha happen to attack into it, you can just use the effect and detach one to save itself. So you still have your 26. And the next turn, you can go into something else that's going to be able to get rid of it. You can go Diamond Dire, you know, you can go for whatever it is you need to go for and get rid of it. Redox. I hate Dragon Rulers so much, but Redox with this deck, it does things. It really honestly does things. Because you can use, like you can ditch two fortresses to summon one of the fortresses back, then use Redox and ditch any other earth type monster and get the other fortress back. Or summon Redox himself back. And then use Redox to go for Draco Sack with the other fortress. And then ditch your other machine type monsters to summon the other fortress back from the graveyard and just explode on your opponent. This deck has a lot of exploding ability just to really wreck your opponent and just leave them kind of like lost and defended. Well, defenseless, I should say. Uh, mind control. A lot of decks can't really use and abuse mind control. Because... What can mind control really gain you? The monster that you take can't be tributed nor declare an attack. The effects can still work. So you do have that plus. <laughs> like if you mind control a Draco Sack, you can use Draco Sack, destroy itself, and pop a card in your opponent's side of the field, and they won't get their Draco Sack back at the well at the end of the turn because you used its effect to destroy itself. So there, there is always that. Uh, in this format, though, there are quite a few decks that go for level 7s and level 4s. Mermails like to go out for Megalo and sit there on a Megalo, or sit on a Abyss lead. You might control it, summon your Redox for your uh, Fortress, use it for your own Draco Sack. Going up against Fusion matchup, use Mind Control take control of their Yamato they can't I mean, they can use turtle to negate it which is fine because then that allows you to go in with another card to destroy it or kill it I mean you just want to be able to stop you just want to be able to make them waste or even if they don't have turtle engraved you can take control of it and then use their own monsters in XYZ and they absolutely hate that and then you detach your monster for its for its effect rather than theirs. So they don't have it in the graveyard to bring back with Regalia. That's amazing. You're going up against Fire Fist matchup or Harp matchup. They have level fours. You know, Harp you know, going up against Harpies, they got out well, they got Cyber Lady out in the field. You know, eighteen hundred beater, you can't really attack over it. Well you mind control it, take their monster, and overlay it for something that's going to allow you to go positive over them. Go for Utopia or 101, Cowboy, just something that's worth going into to be able to use their monster for it. Personally, Abyss Dweller, because if you start MSTing their back row and they get the Hysteric Sign, you know, set face down and you MST it, they're going to start plusing. You take their monster, mix it with the gadget, you can go into Abyss Dweller and capitalize the game by shutting down their Hysteric Sign and they can't use the effect to search plus three at the end of the turn and they went minus because it's like oh they just lost their monster and they just lost their plus ability they didn't search with the effect so what did they really get from it? nothing and you kinda just like put them down in the hole and it, it, it destroys them dark hole mandatory staple I don't have to explain what dark hole does but I can explain to you just how big of an advantage Dark Hole gets you. Your opponent goes in on you, goes in for a big push. You're like, okay, you know, I'm tired of this Dark Hole. And then just like wreck their day. Just wreck their day. They hate it. They absolutely hate it. You just you just get rid of their stuff. 
and boom, gone. Just, just gone. Two double summon. This card is broken. It breaks his deck. It allows you to literally explode all over your opponent in ways they do not want to feel. You can open up turn one, two XYZs they're not going to get over, depending on what the matchup is. You go up against Mermails, you explode into like, Mermails, like you get, you know, gold, like you get two goldfish and two gadgets and a double summon. You can explode into everything you need to kill your opponent's Mermel matchup. You go uh, 10 Goldfish, summon a gadget, search for a gadget, overlay, go for Dweller. 2200 Dweller, I'm not going to get over that very easily. You play Double Summon, you go in for your other Goldfish, go in on your gadget, then go for Steel Swarm Roach. You've got Mermails locked down because they'll choose to activate for a Megalo. You'll negate the summon, although they will pay for the cost, which is the discard. In which then you will use Abyss Dweller. <laughs> and then Abyss Dweller lock out the graveyard effects. So then at that point, they can't really do anything or go in on you. And I mean, Steel Swarm. Still Swarm Roach just locks them down, and they can't really go into much. I mean, next turn, you can just summon Gadgets, just summon Torches, or whatever you got, set back row, and just, just attack them with a 19 beater and a 2200 beater. And there's not a lot that they really can do. They can't come back from that big of a loss turn one. They can't come back that easy. So Double Summon allows you to capitalize on your opponents very quick and get into something absolutely necessary. Two rank up Magic Limited Barians for us. I know that there are a lot of rank up Magic players that play rank up Magic Barians for us in uh, gadgets. This card is so much better. This card is legitimately so much better. Because it allows you to take any rank 4 monster at a base and rank it up into something stronger. We only have two valid targets for our rank of magic, and we only have two rank of magics, so we only have two targets. That, and it doesn't target the highest ranking monster on the field, it just targets a rank 4 monster, so we can continuously rank up if we need to. That's one of the amazing things about rank of magic coming to Barians for us, is we don't have to to worry about what our target is to summon and when we can summon it. There's no summon condition. All you have to do is just have a rank 4 monster and you can go into something stronger. That's what makes this card really OP in any rank 4 deck. You could play rank up Bugins and just destroy people and they will never know, well, they will never see it coming. Three MSTs really important because on our opponent's sideboard is probably the card Mistake which really just kills us. Mistake destroys us so we need to be able to get rid of Mistake as fast as possible. Also for the Sparkfest matchups they like to go into a lot of uh, shenanigans with Tanky and stuff. Search out. Nope we don't want them searching. MST just get rid of it. Bottomless Trap Hole. It does not target. So, Fusion Turtle, you can't do shit to save your Yamato. Bottomless will get rid of it, and there's nothing you can do. However, Bottomless would allow them to set up for a Fusion Carnation play. That's the part you need to be cautious about. If your opponent has a monster in the graveyard, and they go in on Yamato, do not Bottomless Yamato. Destroy it. Don't ever banish him off of Yamato. Because if they have a turtle in the graveyard and you bottomless it, they're going to be able to go in on a Beach Incarnation play. Or drop uh, Mikazuchi on well, drop Mikazuchi on board. That's never good either. But it, Miko doesn't allow them to set up their field. 
Well, it doesn't allow them to set up the great guard fast. I mean, you get rid of Yamato, sure. If they drop Mika, then you know that your bottom list is good. If they don't drop Mika, that's when you know that they probably have Carnation to come and bite you in the ass. It's going to bring back their turtle, bring back their Yamato, and then XYZ into stupid stuff, go into Suzanawo, and just start setting up like crazy. So Bottomless, you really have to watch out when you use it against Fusions. Uh, Fire Fist, get rid of their bears, get rid of Wolf Barks. Those are the key targets for your Bottomlesses uh, in Fire Fist. Another big matchup is Harpies. You can't really get rid of Harpies that easily. You just kind of want to get rid of their field spell. And if you can get rid of their field spell, then you kind of can capitalize on the game. Now, the most important card to Bottomless in Harpies, honestly, is probably their Dragon. Because the smart Harpy player is going to make great sevens often. And is going to do it with Channeler and Dragon. They're also going to go for rank fours like Queen Dragon de Jin to bring back Dragon with Channeler on the field and just keep making shenanigans. You bottomless their dragon, there goes all available big guys, there goes Draco side, there goes everything. Because most players these days in Harpies are only running a dragon at one. So, you can get over dragon. Uh, prophecies, banish that priestess when it hits the field. Just get rid of it. That's your main target in Prophecies to get rid of is that priestess. Because that priestess is the one thing that's going to hurt you and prevent you from winning the game. So, you get rid of Priestess, well, that's good. And, if someone Priestess, you respond with Bottomless Trap Hole, they can't really respond with Fate to get rid of your Bottomless Trap Hole before it resolves and gets rid of their Priestess. So, they're going to end up using their Fate on something else. So Bottomless is great at getting rid of Priestess, which is an amazing card to get rid of because you get rid of Priestess, you've done yourself a good deed. <laughs> Torrential. Doesn't target, wipes the board, just like Dark Hole. Love Torrential Tribute, and we, like you let your opponent go all in, like they're playing with Karakur Gergia. You know, they, they start going in on it. You know, on their, on their last summon... You know, when they, when they fill out their board, unless they have Barkeon, flip Torrential, and just, like, go. Just nuke their board. Then, obviously, your opponent is going to be smart and go for... They would be going for Barkeon next time to get rid of your traps, but you'll know that they'll be going for Barkeon so you can set up against them ahead of time and try to get into Solemn Morning before they can go Barkeon. I mean, and if they do, we can get over Barkeon anyway, very easily. So, I mean, it's not like Barkeon really is that big of a threat against us, because we can just capitalize over Barkeon. Solemn Warning. Solemn Warning is the stupidest card ever. Negate the summon of any summon you want. Doesn't matter what it is, it's gone. Gores, Trag, whatever, it's gone. It's done. Can't do anything. You plan on your opponent... And they go for Draco Sec, negate it, get rid of it. Gone forever. One compulsory evacuation device. Bounce back stupid things. Bounce back Stardust. Bounce back Stardust Spark Dragon. Because there are a lot of uh, Synchro players still that go for Stardust Spark Dragon. That's one of our problem cards because we can't easily get rid of Spark Dragon. So we just like to compulse that back because... Uh, Spark Dragon don't like us. Spark Dragon doesn't like us. Uh, Two-Dimensional Prison. Dimensional Prison is just too good. Gets over a lot of stupid things. And it's a great way to get rid of key cards that your opponent has. Get rid of Megalos. Get rid of Yamatos. If they have wasted their turtle that turn, get over your Yamatos. Get rid of Bears. Get rid of Gorillas. Wolf Barks, whatever your opponent has to get out. Dimensional Prison will just get rid of it. Mirror Force, wipes the board, doesn't target. Love it. Two Finish Chain, 
finished chain nets you a potential positive gain, but a potential negative because of the fact that if that monster is used as XYZ material that you finish chained, finish chain ends up just being a dead card and ends up clogging up your board. So you really got to know when you want to finish chain and when you don't. It's really all about what you finish and what you don't. Because finish chain can become a dead card in your board and clog up your back row. That's just like one thing about it. But other than that, helps you capitalize on your opponent, stops them from going positive, and prevents them from making you go negative. And finish chain is honestly a game saver. And we have three reckless greed. Allows you to just draw, 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 get as much hand advantage, hand advantage over your opponent as possible. It's like we go in on our monsters, we draw, we search, we draw, we search. We, we search out a lot. Then we play, well, let me flip a couple recklesses, draw into all of our traps to set them for our follow-up play for our opponent's turn, just to spring them on our opponent, then, then explode next turn for game. Now we can get into the extra deck. Diamond Dire Wolf. Pretty much Diamond Dire Wolf is always a staple. Allows you to get over stupid, dirty things that most of your other deck can't get rid of. So Diamond Dire Wolf is a great card to sit on. It's a 2k beater, but it's another great card that can just, you know, get rid of stupid stuff that your opponent has. Number 39 Utopia. Honestly, why do I have this? I don't know. My stroke is probably a better choice over this, but at the moment, I don't I didn't really mind wasting Utopia for a rank up magic. And I don't want to waste something that has a potential useful effect. So I have I kind of use Utopia just as a waste. Or like if I need a defense, I'll go into Utopia, then I'll rank it up after I've used it up for defense, and then just go in for offense off Utopia, which is not a bad idea. Two gear Giga X. Honestly, I have considered about jumping this to three, but I don't really know why I'd want to jump this to three. I mean, the first one usually gets bottomless, then I have another one, but I have a lot of plays that I can make in the deck, and I don't really see the point of having a third gear gigant at the moment. I mean, I could put it in, because, well, one usually gets warning, and one usually gets bottomless, so I, there's a lot of times, like, game one, it doesn't, but game two, it really seems to get hit, and game three, well... I just try to quickly get into it as fast as possible, get my stuff out, and then I don't care what happens to Gear Gear after that. So I don't I don't really find that I need three. Number fifty Black Super Corn. Gets over Zen Mains. Uh Fortune Tune, however, has kind of become a bit of a popular little birdie. But uh she can't be targeted, so you know, there goes that play. But Black Super Corn, well, still twelve hundred beater, gets over things like Delmado. Gets over bears and influx damage. So you know, I'm I'm not gonna complain about uh, black ship corn. I'm honestly, not gonna complain. Uh, number one hundred one, great card, brilliant card actually. This guy, wow, one hundred one shark, just utterly broken and stupid. They're like going up against fire, uh, not not fire fist, but uh, going up against fire kings. They get Karunix out. They get it onto the field. You have an issue. You want to get rid of it. You go one on one. You take it. Amazing play. They might chain that circle of the Fire Kings though, and uh, you ain't getting that Karunix. You ain't taking that Karunix. So it the the Fire the Fire King matchup is honestly one of the hardest matchups because it's honestly one of the hardest decks in the current format to beat. Three Axis Fire Kings are going in hard and are hitting and sacking people hard. Those plays are ridiculously nuts. And they are ones to watch out for. And 101 can't cover the job of getting rid of Gruenix. At least not as efficiently. But 101 is a great card. And it meets the standard for Black Ship of Corn. So Black Ship of Corn. You can send that 101 to the graveyard and they can't use the effect to save itself because it sends, not destroys. Gaga Cowboy. 
I'll make it detach, burn my opponent, rank it up. That's the only reason I use Cowboy. When Cowboy can get me over the Stardust Dragon, it can get me over a 3k monster by crashing it. But you know, I, I don't really mind crashing into a 3k, well, a 3k monster. But it, I, I have done it a couple times, and when it works, it works well. And I like it. I like it when it works. If it doesn't work, I don't use it. Still Storm Roach. Shuts down Chaos Dragons. Shuts down Mermails. Uh, shuts down Dark Worlds so being able to get Graph out. After it's in the graveyard, so Steel Storm Roach really is a great card to make. Honestly, it's it's on, it's, on, it's still like one of like the key staple cards for me to have because I've just found so many reasons and so many opportunities to have this in my extra deck. It may get used, it may not get used. A lot of decks these days go for rank four exceeds, which is where Steel Storm Roach doesn't work. But with Mermails being one of the top competitive decks and Chaos Dragons always being one of the top competitive decks. Steel Storm Roach has always been like a practical use for me. Uh, Evil Swarm Exit Tonight. Too good. Clear the board. Then hopefully be able to capitalize from it on your next turn, depending on what you have in your hand, what you draw, whatever. Try to capitalize and gain as much advantage as possible with Exit Tonight. Papal Operative. Still, in my book, one of the best strength for exceeds. In a format where, you know, you get something big on the board, your opponent sets, you go Papal Operative, you pretty much kind of just gave yourself game control right there. Because they, they can't set, because they know you're going to Papal Operative their monster. So they can't set, so they're going to be forced to just normal summon and expose what they have. And expose them to getting wrecked. They have to... They, they don't set at that point because they know that they can't afford to. I mean, they can set Ryko if they have Ryko if you're playing against Light Swarms because they want to get that mill out and that pop. But that's the only thing really that they would set that would be smart to set. Everything else, they just pretty much normal summon so they don't take as much damage. C104. My opinion, one of the best monsters to rank up into, because when it's special summoned, destroys for a trap card in the field. Love getting into 104. That asked me to get over the card mistake, allows me to get over vanity, whatever back row my opponent has, I can get in, I can get over it. I mean, obviously if they have vanity, I'm not going to be able to summon into C104, but the potential is there. Uh, C69. Great card. Really great card. I can't say no to C69. It's a 4k attack theater. Then whenever they attack, destroy all cards that they control. They will not attack you and you have guaranteed game advantage. When you go into C69, you practically win the game. In order for them to get ahead, they will not attack you. Fire Fist is the only prominent deck that can get over C69. Just because they'll go for Tiger King, and they will negate your C69's effect. Then they'll attack you. Will they be able to get over it? Probably not. They'll have to use Bear first to kill it by popping it. So they have multiple options that they can do for an out to C69. So against the Fire Fist matchup, C69... Maybe isn't the greatest card to go into, but it does allow you to save your back row and your other monsters because they're going to need to get rid of C69 as fast as possible. Otherwise, they're going to lose the game because Fire Fist, let's face it, Fire Fist doesn't have an out to big beaters. They don't. And they don't have an out to something that can destroy their entire field when they attack. So they can't afford to risk a C69. So they're going to have to get rid of it. Draco Sack. Same thing, your opponent has to try to get rid of Draco Sack because they can't afford for you to sit on a Draco. You sit on Draco, you can just build up and build up and build up your resources, build up your hand power, keep popping their stuff off, or poke them for damage. I mean, you're going to be doing a lot of stuff 
with Draco Sack that most people aren't going to be able to get rid of it very fast. So Draco Sack gives you massive advantage and massive strong points and allows you to put a foothold on your opponent that they're just not going to really be able to get out of very easily. Like put Fire Fist though, however they can, they go Tiger King, they get Draco Sack's effect, and they just capitalize with Draco Sack. Abyss Dweller. Already kind of went over it. Launch out your opponent's graveyard. Gotta love this because it shuts down Bugins and it shuts down Mormon Elves. Completely. It shuts down Dark Worlds even. They they don't get their Grapha effect. They don't get Grapha Summon. They don't do anything. They can't do anything at all. And I love Abyss Dweller because it just allows you to dominate your opponent and get that first turn of control. You're going up against Dark Worlds, immediately your first turn of the game, go Dweller. You go Dweller, you got game against Dark Worlds. Like that. Abyss Dweller helps you so much in against a lot of decks. Noble Knights, they use Arpadilla to pop your back row. Well, they try to attach it back. They can't. You have Dweller. They can't attach it back. And they just, like, all their Noble Arms cards just become dead. Unless they rank up to the monsters that, well, unless they um, rank into the rank 4 or rank 5 monsters, they're not going to be able to get any of their Noble Arms cards back. Unless it's by their monsters' effects. And I guess the Emerald, just allow us to recycle our gadgets, recycle our hand power, recycle our searches. Just keep the deck running fluently and giving us draws at the same time. For our side deck, 2 effect healer. I think 2 effect healer is very prominent, very, very purposeful in this format, and it honestly does really well against a lot of matchups. Uh, effect healer just really kind of shuts down uh, important decks, but it's not really important enough to main deck it at the moment, but it's still a really good card. Uh, Kaiser Colosseum, he is it for that field control. You go Gigant, I mean you go Gear Gigant, you play Kaiser Colosseum against a deck that spams or sacks, it's a great card to just wreck Heretics. Heretic Dragons are a very popular deck right now, and you go Kaiser Colosseum uh, against a Heretic player, they're not going to be able to get over your Kaiser Colosseum unless they are able to destroy it, which is always an issue with them, you know, having wing beat. But it, it, it forces them to have to waste, and they can either go in on you or they can't. But most of the Dragon World players these days aren't running wing beat, or are only running it at like one or two. So it's not really that big of an issue. And I mean, they more than likely not going to draw it on their first turn. And I mean, if they do, they're extremely lucky. If they don't, well, that sucks for them because they'll drop Tefnut, drop Sue, they won't get the summon from Tefnut. And I mean, they'll have to waste with Sue to kill Kaiser Coliseum and just like, cause them to like, go slow about it. And you can like, really seriously fuck up their loops with Kaiser Coliseum. Uh, three Twister. Twister, just to get over things like Mistake and Vanity. Uh, things that just stop us from summoning, so on and so forth. I love the freaking card. However, at the cost of 500 life points, I don't know if it's worth it. 3 Light Imprisoning Mirror. Honestly, Light Imprisoning Mirror is good, even at 2. So I'm actually going to, uh, going to do something that's just going to make our life a little bit easier. Uh, but... Light Imprisoning Mirror basically is to get over Bugins and Heretics. Pretty much just get over Bugins and Heretics, they can't do anything. Especially Heretics. They, well, they go to pop your Kaiser, well, you'll play Kaiser. They can't, you know, even really summon. They go summon into Sue, they try to get rid of it. You play Light Imprisoning Mirror, so it can't activate its effect. And they're pretty much just like, you know, oh my god, we just lost the game. Uh, I actually decided to tech the Swords of Controlling Light. Uh, one of the top playing Bugin players, 
mentioning that this is a great side card, especially against the Bijan matchups, because you set Yamato, they can't really do anything. And Bijan's are one of the most highly played, overrated decks right now this format. They are really strong, and they are definitely a strong threat. However, Swords of Concealing Light will shut them down. You just stop them for a couple turns, they can't set up, they can't do anything, and Swords of Concealing Light really is just too good. Also, decks that rely on having Monster Presence to search, and stuff like that continuously, Swords of Concealing Light drop their field face down, and they can't really do a whole lot either. So Swords of Concealing Light, mainly just for the Beogen matchup, but it, it has its uses and it also uh, prevents Draco Sack. Like if your opponent has Draco Sack, you set Draco Sack, drop Dark Hole, Draco Sack can't save itself, and it just dies. It just dies. Two traps done. You know, we're trying to search out a card. You know, our opponent plays Mistake. Well, we're, we chain traps done. And they, they would have to chain something two traps done, which more than likely they aren't because most people aren't running seven tools of the bandit or dark bribe uh, in this format. And if they do, then we're still going to plus anyway, and we might plus into the card we're trying to search for. So, I mean, or search and, and plus into something better. But traps done is just to luck out mirror forces and mirror forces stuff like that when we go to explode. Uh, and two vanities emptiness. Vanity, Sentiness, is just to really just like lock up the board. Basically, this is the best combo against the Heretic matchup. Kaiser Coliseum and Vanity's Emptiness is the best mech, well, it's like the best combo. Because they can't special into anything big to get over your monster to kill it so that Kaiser Coliseum isn't an issue. Also, Light Imprisoning Mirror shuts down, Be well, shuts down Beogens. Vanity allows them to, like, when you do get rid of their monster, that they are not blind. They can't really go for uh, Beog Incarnation to try to capitalize. Plus, if you have Kaiser Coliseum against the Beog player, they're not going to be able to play Beog Incarnation anyway, and they're going to have to sit there on their monsters. And with Light and Disney Mirror, they kind of just lost the game right then and there. I mean, sure, the deck, now that they have main deck Decree, but with the three Twisters that we have and the three MSTs, I'm pretty sure it will be covered. But that's kind of like the deck list and explanation and like what matchups it's good against and what it's bad against. Uh, what's really good, what what really hurts us though is this deck doesn't really do that well against, um, this deck doesn't do well against Fire Kings. But other than that, this deck really just capitalizes a lot over most of the meta. Which is one of the reasons why we kind of have an advantage over a lot of the meta decks. Anti-meta, on the other hand, has advantage over this because we can't really explode and go in into our mass search powers. Like if our opponent has like a fossil den or a vanity, well, we can't go in and explode. So it's going to be a very slow, controlled-paced game, and it's going to be a very enticing game. And it's just going to keep you sitting there on the edge of your seat. It's like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, I want to go in, I want to go in. But you can't because they have their stuff. So you just kind of have to cause them to, to waste their stuff. And I mean, it, it's it's just a very tedious matchup against anything that stops us from summoning. It's just very tedious. But this deck can either go in slow or it can go in fast. I mean, it's, it's your choice how you play the deck. But it's one of those decks that can set up fast and explode, like turn two, turn three. And explode in and just go and take advantage of the board. And if you haven't taken advantage of the board by turn 2 or turn 3, you may or may not lose the game depending on what you have. But this deck overall, Saldi as a whole, is a very good, strong deck. And it, it has its presence on the field, and it just puts its work in. But thank you for watching, guys. I hope this guide really helped you to be able to sort out your decks, to find out like what it's good against, what tech is good against what decks, you know, just a bit of ideas that might help you just stop your opponent, further slow your opponent down, and really just, like, keep control of the game. So, anyways, guys, my name is Walking the Mechlord, and peace out.